Hello, I'm Samuel Hansen. Mm. And I'm Peter Oliver. Yeah, you know, as usual. usual. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm just drinking from my George Green mug. You know, for uh, a long time I really thought that mug was imaginary. Yes. Uh, this mug has on it a picture of a windmill, the name George Green, and across the top a mathematical formula. Um, George Green was a mathematician who lived in Nottingham for much of his life. He owned a windmill in the city. And one version of his life is almost as a provincial miller. He, he, he grew up, he had children, he ran a mill, he died, and there you go. We're but not actually, really too interested in that part of the story, are we? Not, not as much, no. And then, uh, on the other hand, he wrote some mathematics in his spare time, uh, and eventually he went to Cambridge and studied mathematics, and he published, in the end, ten scientific papers, as they were called memoirs, um, which had a huge and lasting impact on, first of all, 19th century science, and a huge resurgence into 20th century science. Uh, so we're going to find out a little bit about George Green and his life, and his legacy in mathematics. And we're going to start at the mill. Yes. Take two. George Green was born in 1793. His father was also called George Green and was a baker in Nottingham. And while our George Green was a boy, his father built the mill, which is behind us, uh, here in Snenton, which is about a mile from the centre of Nottingham. George Green worked in the mill as a boy. Uh, the mill was owned by his father, but it was run by a mill manager, and George became friendly with the mill manager's daughter. And eventually, uh, they never married, but they had seven children together. Um, and it's thought that George Green did a lot of his um, mathematical work, particularly his early work, uh, while working at the mill. And he's, there's a sign behind us with an inscription, uh, a quote from him. He describes having done the mathematics in hours stolen from my sleep, because he was working full time in the mill at the time. Oh, I thought you were going to be the little one. Oh, shall I be the little one? Uh, no, too late. Let's go. Okay, so we are in the mathematical playground at George Green's mill. And um, so. Sam, will you tell us something about Newton and Leibniz? Okay, so Newton and Leibniz were the two inventors of the calculus. They invented essentially at the same time, but Leibniz did at one point before he published his version have a letter of Newton's that described his version of the calculus, and this caused a rather big schism between both the English and the continental calculus schools. I, where Newton claimed that Leibniz had stolen his calculus. Okay, and this led to a, a, an argument that then became a schism in England. Yeah, that, that's why I said schism. Yes. <laughs> and in England, it was very normal to learn Newton's form of the calculus, and on the continent, it was very normal to learn... The Leibnizian form, yes. Or the one that derived from that. And the Leibnizian form is the form that we use today, and the Newtonian form is, is not used today. Uh, it, with the exception of physics, it is used heavily in physics. Okay. And... George Green, uh, despite growing up in England, managed to learn the continental form. And let's go and find out how. So we're now at the Nottingham High School, which is taken over from uh, what once was the Nottingham Free School in Stony Street in Nottingham, um, where a man called John Topless was headmaster. And John Topless was um, a, a keen mathematician. Uh, and he'd been to Cambridge, and then he was master of the school here. And he actually published a translation of... Laplace, uh, and it is generally considered that George, he heavily influenced uh, George Green in the work that he did, and uh, Laplace was part of the Continental School of uh, Calculus. And so this is, this is a possible answer to the question. Actually, I have a, a book here which is A History of Nottingham High School, um, which quotes a biography by H.G. Green, uh, a biography of George Green written in 1946, um, as saying that it has been claimed internal evidence proves Green's indebtedness to Topless's book for the inspiration of his famous essay, um, which was printed in 1828. So this, this gives that claim that, that Topless is the source of the continental mathematics that Green unexpectedly was self-taught in. <laughs> so this is Bromley House in the centre of Nottingham, which was the home of Nottingham Subscription Library. George Green was a subscriber at the library in the early 1800s, and it's thought this is where he read much of his mathematics. In 1828, he published an essay on the application of mathematical analysis to the theories of electricity and magnetism. And this was published by subscription through the Nottingham Library. What this means is that a, a circular went round an advert uh, that proposed that Mr. Green was going to publish this essay and subscribers were sought for. And 51 subscribers all paid seven shillings and sixpence to receive a copy of the essay. 
One copy of the essay went to Edward Bromhead, who lived near Lincoln. Bromhead had been at Cambridge with uh, Babbage and was part of a group of people who were interested in the Leibnizian form of calculus coming from the continent. So Bromhead recognised the significance of the essay. Bromhead began a correspondence with Green and encouraged him to produce further works of mathematics and ultimately encouraged him to go to Cambridge to read mathematics. But Green graduated mathematics at Keyes College, Cambridge and became a fellow of Keyes College, which meant he was involved in the uh, running of the college. But after not too long, he was taken ill and returned home to Nottingham and died. So we're here at St. Stephen's Church in Stenton. We're just down the hill from the windmill. Uh, this is the parish church for Stenton, and this is George Green's grave. George Green was buried with his parents and with his son. And what I didn't realise the first time I saw this grave is he's described as he dies as a fellow of Keys College, Cambridge. And in order to be a fellow of Keys College, Cambridge, uh, you're required to be unmarried and celibate. And he's buried with his son, <laughs> one of seven children. But we do have to remember, he was unmarried, so he got half of it right. He did get half of it right. Um, so, so Jane Smith, his, his um, partner, uh, is buried nearby and quite sadly not buried in the same grave. Okay, so we're now inside St. Stephen's Church in Snempton. And behind us is a plaque which was erected to mark the bicentenary of George Green's birth. Uh, it describes him as Miller, mathematician and physicist. Um, now, I have here a quote from his obituary. This is from the Nottingham Review of the 11th of June, 1841. It says, He was the son of a miller residing near Nottingham, but having a taste for study, he applied his gifted mind to the science of mathematics. Had his life been prolonged, he might have stood eminently high as a mathematician. Now, we know that he did stand eminently high as a mathematician, so let's go find out how that happened. So George Green had published the essay and had uh, died in relative obscurity um, in, in Nottingham. And his work was fairly unknown. But now we know about him today and I have my George Green mug, so uh, how did that happen? So the story is that um, young Thompson, who, who later, Lord, later became Lord Kelvin, was uh, reading widely on electricity and came across a reference to the remarkable essay of Mr. Green of Nottingham. Uh, but he couldn't find a copy of this essay. So then he was, he was at Cambridge having dinner with his tutor uh, one night and he found out his tutor had three copies of the essay. You can sort of imagine George Green when he went to Cambridge wandering around giving people <laughs> copies of the essay. Uh, so, so Kelvin um, Thompson then uh, goes to Paris with, three, uh, with two copies of the essay in his bag and he gives one to somebody and pro they promise to publish it in a German journal of mathematics. And it's from there that the sort of snowball begins. And Kelvin's contemporaries are... Stoke and, Stokes and Clark Maxwell and people like that, and this is where the whole effect of what Green did starts to have an effect on. He was particularly interested in waves, I think, so a lot of it is electromagnetism um, sort of starts to come in, but also sound, water waves, that sort of thing is all, is all affected. Uh, and when you go to the George Green uh, Library now, there's a science museum there, a, a small set of exhibits around those themes, because those are what Green was interested in. So I have, um, I have some quotes here. Uh, that I took from a, from a book published by Nottingham Castle in 1976. Uh, one of these is, is from William Thompson's diary, uh, and Thompson writes, I have been studying Green's memoirs. I see that I have most unwittingly trodden almost exactly in his steps as far as regards electricity. Um, and this other one is, is St uh, Stokes, George Gabriel Stokes, um, wrote a report on recent researches in hydrodynamics. And he wrote, Mr. Green's memoirs are very remarkable, both for the elegance and rigour of the analysis and for the ease with which he arrives at important results. And I, I find this very nice because Green's, uh, the preface to his essay, he's very apologetic about, the, uh, about publishing the very, essay. Very, 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 <laughs> very. And he, he sort of writes that, I hope you will indulge me in, in allowing me to, to present this work to you and, and all this other. And he has this quote where he says... Um, if, if these works have been useful in any way and on the application of, uh, to science, then the author will deem himself amply repaid for his work on them. And it had this massive effect on, on 19th century science. And actually this generation, uh, Thomson's and, and Clark Maxwell and Stokes and all that, saw the reintroduction of Leibnizian calculus into, into England. And part of that story is, is George Green and his remarkable essay. Now then, later on, it starts to have an even bigger impact when Einstein came to visit uh, we're in the, uh, by the Einstein blackboard at the University of Nottingham, uh, from when Einstein gave a lecture here at the university. 
And the chap who he stayed with, Professor Granger, is said to have shown, Green a copy, uh, shown Einstein a copy of Green's essay. Um, and Einstein made some comment about how, um, how it predicted the work of later mathematicians. Particularly Gauss. Particularly Gauss, according to, the, uh, uh, according to a piece that the professor wrote for the local newspaper. He wrote an account of Einstein's visit. And my final example of this, they had a bicentenary of Green's birth in 1993. And Julian Swinger, who won the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics jointly in 1965 um, for work on electro quantum electrodynamics, uh, he, he writes an account of his, his use of Green's work. And he writes about, uh, in World War II, he worked on radar, and he used Green's functions to help develop radar. And I think we know radar had a huge effect on, uh, on World War II. And then later on, he got this problem in quantum electrodynamics, and he used... Green's functions again to get him through this problem. So it's, it's having an even more, even more of an effect um, in quantum physics as it did in 19th century physics as well. So a, a, a good source of biography for George Green is uh, D. M. Cannell, Mary Cannell, who wrote a, an excellent, well, a series of biographies getting increasingly uh, detailed as time went on. And in one of those, she writes that Green's mathematics um, in the 20th century has perhaps been more important than Newton's. Hey, kitty, good timing! Mm -hmm. If you would have come in like five seconds early, you would have ruined the shot! <laughs> Never do this many things in this short of a period of time. Never. It's a bad idea. It's fine. It's